Thanks for joining me. This is Professor Jared Rathel. So, much like last week, lesson 4-2 today is just one lesson, but it is a weighty one. This lesson is incredibly content-rich. So this week, we're going to be exploring each of the 10 major animal organ systems. So I've broken what would be a very long lecture up into 10 pieces so that you can work at your own pace. Each piece is focused on a different animal organ system. So many of you are bound for bio 201 and 202, which focus solely on human anatomy and physiology. But in bio 182, we're gonna take a much more holistic approach. So we're going to be surveying organ systems from simple to complex across the animal kingdom. An important point here, complexity in an organ system, like we see here in this exquisitely preserved Homo sapien, doesn't necessarily imply that that organ system is inherently better in any way. So each evolutionary lineage has been sculpted by natural selection across deep time to evolve organ systems that are adapted to allow that particular species to exploit its particular ecological niche. So it's definitely something to ponder when we compare the simple say a nerve net in jellyfish, to the complex, like the mammalian central nervous system, evolutionarily derived complexity doesn't necessarily equal better. So we're going to start with digestion. Digestion is the process of breaking large molecules up ingested in foodstuffs into small molecules that can be absorbed and utilized by the organism. This is a huge bear that has evolved to specialize on eating solely bamboo, which is a grass. So a grass that's not particularly rich in calories, meaning that giant pandas have to eat a lot of bamboo, like 83 pounds in one day. To meet their energy needs, this bear is going to feed for 14 hours a day. So there are two forms of digestion. When the panda actually physically crunches down and chews that fibrous bamboo like you see in the picture, that's mechanical digestion, the physical process of breaking down food into smaller pieces. Chemical digestion is going to use enzymes, enzymes like saliva and a whole host of gastric juices that are going to chemically cleave those large molecules into small molecules capable of being absorbed through the intestinal wall. So the nadarians, animals like anemones and jellyfish, have a simple gastrovascular cavity. So foodstuffs enter the mouth and move into the gastrovascular cavity. Inside of this cavity, they're bathed in digestive enzymes, and then the foodstuffs are then engulfed by the gastrodermis, this lining of cells here, where further digestion and absorption takes place. By the time we get to the annelids, the segmented worms, like the earthworm you see on the top, as well as the arthropods and all of the vertebrates, we observe the evolution of a true alimentary canal, a one-way gut where the entrance is the mouth, the foodstuffs move through this canal and are excreted out the exit, out the anus. So that's radically different from the planaria, the flatworms, who have just one opening. So they're going to consume foodstuffs through their mouth, they're going to digest and absorb, and then they're going to excrete waste 
through that same opening, through their mouth. Mammalian digestion, like the human digestive system that you see before you, is going to progress in a stepwise fashion where a variety of glands, including the salivary, the pancreas, the liver, the gallbladder, they're going to secrete digestive juices at specific stages during the digestive process. So just as in the panda, humans begin by masticating their food, mechanical digestion. In the mouth, the particles are bathed in salivary amylase, ACE, A-S-E. Remember, digestive juices ending in A-S-E represent enzymes, catalysts that accelerate the chemical breakdown of large molecules. So we have two pipes in our neck. We have the esophagus, which is part of the digestive system that delivers food from the mouth to the stomach, as well as the trachea. The trachea is the cartilaginous windpipe. It's part of the respiratory system, and we'll return to it shortly. So these two pipes meet at a junction known as the pharynx. The trachea is covered by a little flap when we swallow called the epiglottis. That keeps food from literally going down the wrong pipe. So the bolus that you can see descending down the esophagus, it's forced down the esophagus by rhythmic contractions of smooth muscles. It's called peristalsis. You can really see this nicely demonstrated on the snakes with their very long esophagus. In the stomach, the food stuff is next bathed in gastric juices, including hydrochloric acid, a very strong acid with a pH of 2. Ever wonder why it burns so bad when you, when you vomit? That's a highly acidic environment. As well as protease, ACE, a protein digesting enzyme called pepsin. The chyme then passes into the small intestine about two to six hours later. So the average human small intestine is approximately 20 feet long. So when you think about the small intestine, I want you to think about absorption. In the first section, the duodenum, the chyme mixes with digestive juices created by the liver and the pancreas. The liver, the largest internal organ in the body by mass, is a biochemical factory, which produces things like bile. The greenish bile is stored in the gallbladder, like you see here, and then drips through the cystic duct into uh, the duodenum. Bile is necessary to break down large fat molecules. Moving down into the microbial rainforest of the small intestine, we see villi and microvilli that are going to increase the surface area and therefore the absorption rates of nutrients out of the intestine, through the intestinal wall, and into the capillaries. And finally, howdy ho everybody, I'm Mr. Hanky. I hope you remember South Park. <laughs> the large intestine, often referred to as the colon, is very important for A, the recovery of water, as well as B, the uh, manufacture of B vitamins by mutualistic bacteria that are housed in the large intestine. So our microbiome is influenced by what we feed it, by what we eat. A diet rich in probiotics 
have profound implications for human health, including promoting psychological health in what is deemed the gut-brain axis.